Hi there, fifth wheel owners. Today in your 2017 Keystone, Montana, we're gonna be taking a look at and showing you how to install Kodiak's 13 inch disc brake kit. To help us with this installation, we're also going to be using Hydrostar's 1600 PSI brake actuator and Hydrostar's tandem axle brake line kit. If you need a triple axle kit, Hydrostar has those available here at eTrailer.com as well. And this is what our disc brake setup looks like when it's installed. You'll get a new disc brake rotor, as well as the calipers fully loaded with the brake pads already installed in them and the brackets necessary to get that all installed. When installing these, I do highly recommend replacing your bearings as well as the grease seal in the back. You can get those here at eTrailer.com. It features an eight on six and a half bolt pattern with half inch studs, so you can reuse your old lug nuts, they'll thread right onto here. These are designed for 7,000 pound axles and they're gonna provide you with an improved braking performance over your drum brakes. It does this because it has more surface area that it can grab because we have a pad on each side of the rotor and the clamping force is gonna be better than that of which how the drum brakes work instead of pushing the shoes outward, which has significantly less contact. If you've ever looked at a pair of shoes after taking them off, after they've worn down for a while, you'll see that usually towards one side of the pad it's very thick because it hasn't even touched the brake drum yet and the other side's going to be quite a bit thinner because it's only wearing in those little small spots. Our caliper and bracket is going to be constructed of cast iron with an e-coat finish to protect them against rust and corrosion. We'll begin our installation by removing the tire. You will need to lift the vehicle up so that way the axles are suspended so you can remove this. There's a couple of ways you could lift it up. You could use your leveling jacks. If it will get it up high enough, if it doesn't, you could always put some blocks or bricks underneath there to help get you a little higher, or you could use a floor jack but no matter whatever you use to lift it up, you want to make sure you put jack stands underneath the frame to ensure that it's not being supported just by hydraulics. We're using a lift here. We've got it lowered down in the locks, so we've got ours all set up. We're going to be taking our wheels off using a 19 millimeter socket. If you don't have an impact like this, before you lift the vehicle, you want to just take your wrench and crack each of the nuts loose because it'll be difficult to do it once the wheel can spin. But if you've got a gun, they'll just come right off. Now that we've got all the lug nuts off, we can just take the wheel off and we're just going to set it aside. We can now begin removing our old drum assembly. The cover here, you can just knock this off with a rubber mallet. So we're just kind of tapping on it like that. Just kind of work it back and forth and it'll just pop right off of there. Below that now, we have our lock right there. And to remove the lock, I like to use a screwdriver to just pop behind it. And once you get it popped out, I like to try to keep my hands from getting dirty, so I'll just grab it with our needle nose and we'll set it aside. We can now remove the nut. And I like to use a pair of channel locks as you can set it up to the right size easily because these aren't very tight. And we're just going to pull this off of here now and we're gonna set it down. Our outer bearing now needs to come out. And the easiest way that I like to get this out, if you just pull the assembly off, that bearing is gonna fall out of there. So I like to take a screwdriver and just kinda, just got it resting against my hip. And I'm just gonna pull out a little bit. And you can see the bearing just slides right out of there. Sometimes you gotta get a little more. And then we'll use our screwdriver to set it down. There is a washer on the back side of your bearing and it often just sticks to the bearing like it did here. You can see I can move it off. We want to just keep that in mind because we are going to be reusing that washer, but we're going to be putting new bearings in. The whole hub now will just slide right off. Sometimes it does get caught in your brake pads. You may have to go into the back and loosen them up, but in most cases, it'll just pull right off. So we can go ahead and remove the assembly behind it. I do like to get all this grease off of here just to help again minimize that mess. So we're just going to wipe all that away. And we don't need to get all of it off right now. We'll clean it all the way up before we reassemble, just getting that bulk out of there. There's five studs with nuts on them. We need to remove all the nuts. We're gonna use a 15 millimeter socket to do so. I wanna make sure you keep these nuts because we are gonna be reusing them. Now that we've got the last one off, before we can just slide the assembly off to there, it is still wired in to your electric brakes. 
So on the back side of our cover here, we're gonna have some wiring. So we're just gonna pull this wiring out of the little tab here on the back of the backing plate. And then we wanna make sure that we cut the wires here. This wire here, you do have the option if you want to just stick it back in there or you could cut it and remove it. It's really up to you what you want to do with it. I'm gonna make it so it looks nice here at the end, but for now we're just gonna leave it sit there. It's not gonna bother us at this point. You can tuck it out of the way, whatever you wanna do. Since we're installing hydraulic brakes, we won't need the wiring anymore. And I'll be disconnecting the wiring up at the front of the vehicle. So these are gonna be dead wires. So it's not gonna hurt them to be here as long as you disconnect them up front. So the assembly just then pulls off. We'll set it aside. And then we can finish cleaning up our spindle there. I recommend you use a little bit of brake clean. That way you can spray it all off and just kind of get, get it nice and clean. So we're gonna clean this up and once we get that all spotless, we'll begin installing our new components. Next, we're going to install our caliper bracket. You can see here that it says outside, so we want this facing towards us. Next, we need to determine the orientation. If your axles are above 8,000 pounds, you would put it with the caliper on top. And if they're below 8,000 pounds, you'll put it facing towards the rear. Since ours is below 8,000, we're just gonna slide it on like that. You'll see that it lines up all nice and the various holes. It's only gonna fit on a couple of different ways, so it's hard to get it wrong, really. We're gonna reuse the nuts that we had removed to secure this bracket. And since the brakes we're putting on are only rated for 7,000 pounds, you're always gonna be in this orientation when using these parts. Well then just tighten them back down. We'll then wanna to torque our hardware to the manufacturer's specifications. Next, we're gonna to need to pack our new bearings. We do have bearing packers available here at eTrailer.com. So you can purchase those. It's gonna make it a lot easier to pack the bearings and it's gonna be a lot faster. But I'll show you real quick how you can pack it by hand. If you're gonna be packing it by hand, you just wanna take some grease. Some people like to put it on the palm of their hand and smash it in. I just prefer to use my fingers. I've already kind of started it here. And we're just gonna work this grease in all the way around, starting on the back side here, because it's got a wider opening. And once you've got it filled in here in the back, we wanna keep the process of pushing that grease down in there until it starts to come out on the other side. You can see there's a little spot there that I've got where it started to come out on the other side. And I'm just gonna keep on doing this again over and over until you're starting to smush grease all the way out the smaller lip here on the other side. Now I'm doing this with my bare hands because it doesn't bother my skin, but there are some people who do get irritated by the grease. So I do recommend that you wear a pair of gloves if you're not sure whether or not it'll irritate you. So I've finished packing it here and you can see all the way around on the other side, we've got grease completely filling in all the cavities. So it's nice and packed. So this was the larger of the two bearings. This is our inner bearing and this is the one we need first. Down here we have our new brake rotor and the bearing is going to fit right down in there. The races are already installed inside of the brake rotor. So you don't have to worry about that and that's really the main reason why we're replacing the bearings. Even if your old bearings look like they're in an okay condition, you, I highly recommend that you replace them because they've worn to the races in your drum. So when they go to wear to this race, they could potentially fail prematurely. So we wanna have new bearings so they're, they're a match set for one another. So we can go ahead and install our grease seal. One of the things you might wanna do, because you can see here I've cleaned my hands up, is Finish packing your other bearing. You have a smaller one for the outer bearing. And while your hands are all messy, it's a good idea to just go ahead and get that done. So you can clean up and then we can put this seal in. When putting the seal in, you want to make sure that you drive it down nice and even. A trick a lot of people use is using a block of wood, but we also have seal drivers here at eTrailer.com. And with this particular setup, I do highly recommend a seal driver because in most cases you just normally put the seal in until it's flush with the back of the rotor. But I'll show you here once we get it down in there that there's a taper and the seal actually has to go a little bit further down than flush. So now we're just gonna take the seal driver that matches the size of our seal. We got it so it's just slightly smaller than the seal and we're just gonna tap it in there. Just 
kind of check it periodically while you're hitting it to make sure that it's going in even. So you can see here that it's nice and flush down below the taper. We're just kind of feeling around to make sure that it feels nice and even. And we're down below that taper and that's gonna ensure the seal is in the appropriate location for the inner lip to ride on our spindle. At this point now we can install our assembly. So we're just gonna take it. Be careful not to nick the seal on the spindle when you're sliding it on there. And once the bearing hits the spindle, sometimes the thing just slides on nice and easy. Other times you gotta give it a little push to get her to go into place. We can then take our outer bearing that we have packed and we're just going to set it in there. We're gonna follow that up with the washer that we needed to reuse and then our nut. So when tightening this nut down, in the end, we don't really want it to be that snug, but to ensure that our bearings and our seal and everything we have, it is all nicely seated properly. I'll go back to the channel locks again. We're gonna finish tightening it down. And I like to spin the rotor while tightening it. Because again, we're just trying to make sure they're seated. We're gonna be backing this back off. But now that it's nice and snug, we know that they're seated. So then we're just gonna take the nut now and just back it off. And we're just gonna turn it until it makes contact with the washer. So you can feel there's like nothing. And then when you turn it, there's our contact right there. You can, you can feel it and it stops. We're not going tight with it at all. We're not putting extra pressure on it just till it stops. And then we can reinstall our lock tab. Sometimes you do have to turn the nut just a little bit to get the lock tab to properly line up. You can see there it turned a little bit on us. It turned more than I would like it to, so I'm just going to pop it back off. And then we're going to turn it again and see if we can't get it to pop on there without turning our nut too much. It can be kind of a little pain sometimes when they get caught on the lips. Once you get it on, it's going to hold our nut in place and ensure it can't back off. At this point now, we can use the easy lubes here on the end and fill it up with grease. We are using red wheel bearing grease. You can get some here at eTrailer.com if you need some. The reason why we chose the red is because that's the kind that they had when we removed our original bearings. Because it's really not good practice to mix types of grease as they could break down and not give you the proper lubrication you need. So if you can, just match it up. And it can take a while to fill this up, but we're gonna pump it until we st start to see some of the grease pushing out from around the bearing. We can see it pushing a little bit of air out there. And there's the grease. So we've got it nice and full now. So now we can take our cap here and it just taps right back into place. Just kind of work your mallet around it. Highly recommend a rubber mallet as a metal one's gonna dent the cap up. It's not gonna really hurt it if you dent it just a little bit, but for appearance sake, works a little better. Make sure everything spins okay. And now we can put our caliper on. On your caliper, you do have slide pins here. If the slide pin's sticking out too far, you're gonna have a hard time getting the caliper in place. So just to make things a little bit easier, you can take your channel locks and make sure that that slide is pushed in. Doesn't need to be pushed in very far, we're just kind of making it just flush. So you can see we didn't really move it very much, but that little bit of movement does make a big difference. And I'm gonna make sure you get your bolts slid in as well as you're not gonna be able to slide the top bolt in after you put your caliper in. You will need to pull those back a little bit because they're also going to cause it to not fit if they're sticking out. That's why we move the slides in. We're just gonna line it up over our rotor and then push it in place. We can then install those bolts right into the caliper bracket. We can then tighten them down with a 13 millimeter socket or wrench. I like to make sure that they're both started 
before finishing, tightening them down snug, because if they're not started, it can make the caliper move a little bit, and then you'll have a hard time getting that bolt installed. We can then torque our caliper bolts per the instructions that come included with them. We've now got one rotor installed, so we're gonna repeat the same process with the other side and with both of them on the other axle as well. Once we've got all of those complete, we'll need to set up our actuator, run our lines back to our caliper here, and then we can bleed the brakes. We've got line kits and actuators available here at eTrailer.com. We're going to be using a 1600 PSI actuator to ensure we've got enough brake pressure for our rotors and our caliper setup. Now we need to bleed our brakes. We need to get all the air out of the system, so we just have brake fluid in it. We're gonna start at the caliper that is the furthest away from where our actuator is. So we put the actuator at the front on the driver's side. We're here at the rear on the passenger side. And you wanna use the top bleeder screw. Some of your kits that you get do have bottom bleeder screws. That's just because you can change the orientation depending upon the application for this caliper always use the top. To help minimize mess, we're just gonna use a hose to direct the fluid down into a container. And then we'll need an assistant to either pull the breakaway switch pin or activate the brake controller to start pumping it. You wanna make sure you've got the actuator filled with fluid and you can use dot three or dot four brake, brake fluid. We're using dot three. All right, Shane. And we wanna do this until we get a nice solid stream, just like we have there. There's no air bubbles in it, so we're gonna close it off. You can turn it off. And we're gonna just repeat this process at each wheel until we get a nice solid stream out of each one so we don't have any air in the system. After each time that you bleed some of the fluid through the system, you wanna have your assistant just double check the reservoir to make sure that it's full because if you run it empty while bleeding, you have to start the process all over again. Now that we've got all the fluid bled out, we wanna make sure that we don't have any leaks. To do this, we're just gonna pull the breakaway switch pin. It's gonna deadhead our pump, put it at the maximum pressure, and we're gonna check each of the unions and fittings to make sure that there's nothing leaking there. We'll start with our first connection here, nice and dry. So we're just gonna move back and then check each individual one. Especially make sure to check the unions, that's usually the spot you're gonna find leaks the most. But we're all dry, so we're all good to go. We can now reinstall our tires and start enjoying our new brake system. And that completes our installation of Kodiak's disc brake kit on our 2017 Keystone Montana.